everybody. My, my name is Mr. Benet. You can call me Adam Kickest. This is my teacher, uh, my teacher name. So um, I'm a teacher from Anglophone East um, at a different high school. Don't judge me for that, uh, Harrison Trimble. Uh, but um, uh, Ms. Seeley and I have uh, gone back quite a few years and worked over some different projects. And this year I'm working at the department uh, with something called the Centers of Excellence. And the, uh, the Center of Excellence that I lead up is that of digital innovation. So digital innovation is a huge umbrella term, right? That means a lot of things, okay? And we already know about some of those things that are uh, out there. Computer science and programming, we, everybody knows what that is at this point, right? It's pretty mainstream at this point. But there's a whole bunch of other domains and areas in technology, right, that you could get into. So people sitting here, right, are all of you going to work in tech in your life? Probably not. Are all of you going to use tech as part of your daily job? Probably so, right? So those are the things we're trying to educate our students to start thinking about. There are really amazing, rewarding careers inside of technology. Right, and I know that we're in New Brunswick and we're tucked away. Silicon Valley is a far way away from where we're at. But what we're trying to convince students to think about is say, hey, think about these different pathways that exist. There's creative pathways, right? So the digital creative arts, the work that uh, Matt over here is doing, recording video, content creation, right? Is there anybody in this school that is a TikTok uh, or YouTube or Instagram doing yeah, any TikTok. kind of, you know? has any sort of following, it takes a lot of work. And you don't just flip on a camera, right? And it's away you go. There's a lot that goes into it in front of the camera, but behind the camera. But then we also think about computer science and programming, right? We all have smartphones probably or laptops. We use stuff every single day, but somebody spent thousands of hours making that stuff, right? So that's what we're trying to convince and convey. And a massive area is that of cybersecurity. So cybersecurity is something that it impacts every single one of us, young, old, schools, municipalities, the federal government, the military, industry, and it's a really, really important thing that we have to consider, okay? And in your generation, it's only gonna continue to rise and rise and be of greater importance. So those are the sorts of things we want you to at least be aware of, right? You're all smart enough to like, you know, when you cross the road, you look both ways, right? You know little things in your daily life about safety, but on the internet, it's the same. And you probably know lots of people that have been scammed, that have been hacked, that have like all kinds of bad stuff can happen. And what we need to try and teach our students is all those skill sets as well, right? All the way from the boring stuff of passwords. Ugh, I know passwords are, everybody hates them. I love passwords. Oh, I love passwords too. I probably love them. It's been around a good right journey. But most of us, we sit here, it's like, oh my gosh, another password, another account, this, that, the other. The world is changing really rapidly. The internet is super vast and there's, there's different threat actors. There's, there's all kinds of stuff that we need to be aware of. So that's all we want to talk about. But when it comes to cyber, and I know that Ian, our guest speaker, is going to speak about this, there's a whole slew of career pathways. It's a whole subset. Cybersecurity as a term is, I don't know, if I were to throw it to you, what, is, but what does the word cybersecurity even mean to a student your age? It's, 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 and I, it's a bit of a big word. It's something that's nebulous. It's something that's hard to put your finger on exactly what it is, probably to you all. But we want to show you, hey, it's kind of important. It's very important. And then we also say, hey, if you're into this sort of stuff, and we'll talk about some of the different career pathways, it might be something that you excel at. So Ms. Seeley teaches a cybersecurity 12 zero class, right? We have computer science classes in this school. We have things like the Cyber Titan competition that some students might be involved in over the years. Maybe you have some friends or relatives that have participated in that, right? But we want you all to harness the power of digital technologies to create, right? And to have a productive life. And you can probably have a pretty good career in life right here in New Brunswick. So those are sort of some of the things that led me to Sealy and have led me to Ian. And I won't talk any longer because I'm boring, um, but we have a, a very good, uh, yeah, special guest speaker today. So Ian McMillan is joining us, a cybersecurity professional. He's worked in the industry for how many years? Are you at now? Ish. Uh, 10 years in tech, six years in security. Okay. And so Ian comes to us from MNP, which is a company might not oh, know. Oh, oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And, um, but we're really excited to have him and take time out of your day to come speak to uh, the future generation here in New Brunswick. And uh, yeah, I'll just I'll turn it over. Great. Okay, thank you. Thanks so much. 
Morning, guys. Um, so I am aware that this is probably your last period before launch. Is that right? Yeah. No. Oh, yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Okay. All right. Um, I thought I was the thing I would block you for lunch, but I was going to make this as safe as possible. Uh, thanks so much for, for coming, even though I think you have to be here, but I appreciate your interest in being some and, and listening to me talk today. Um, thank you to Ms. Ely and Adam and everybody that's sort of been trying to get students to learn more about tech and more about security uh, and uh, making the opportunity for me to come here and to talk to you today. Uh, as I want to mention, my name is Ian McMillan. So I'm a cybersecurity professional. I work at MNP Digital, so a little bit about MNP. So it's actually an accounting firm at, at its core that has recently, in the last you know, in the last ten years or so, has built out a technology and a cybersecurity practice. So we work as consultants to help organizations implement technology in different ways to help them secure their business, to help them you know conduct projects to you know implement new technologies and do new things, uh, and we work with them to do that. So we are across the country. So we have about 8,000 employees in total, about 500 of us work in tech, uh, and then close to 100 of us work in cyber specifically. So I am the Atlantic lead for cyber uh, from MAP. So I work with organizations all over Atlantic Canada and some nationally as well to help them do security, be secure, uh, implement security strategy, and things that interest. A little bit about me. So I started out actually, this is a former software developer. That was my sort of my last role. I actually started as a graphic designer, and we're going to talk a little bit about that. So, but I was sitting where you're sitting. Um, you know, my guidance counselor was like, "Yeah, you're going to take biology, chemistry, or physics for science," and uh, I was like, "Go to university and take computer science or engineering or something like that." And there was a, a need there in terms of skill sets related to tech that was emerging, and I had that skill set. You know, scoring my a hundreds and 99s in computer science. There was no cyber security 12 to when I was in school. And uh, yeah, there, there was just, I didn't have that connection between what I wanted to be doing as a career or where I would end up right now and what I wanted to do when I'm sitting where you're sitting. So hopefully today I'll try and draw some of those lines, create that delineation between things you like doing and how you can turn it into a career and where cyber might fit into that. I'm uh, a CISM from an organization called ISACA. So I'm a certified information security manager. So it was a big exam, you have five years of experience. Um, it's similar to like an accountant that's a CPA or an engineer that's a professional engineer, like a PN, it's a professional designation. So uh, I actually don't have formal education in cyber. I'm gonna talk a little bit about that, but I do have a credential that makes me a credentialed cybersecurity professional. I co-founded a company called Bozron Security. So as a software developer, I uh, created a tech company in Fredericton, that's where I'm from. And uh, yeah, helped build that up to at 65 employees and 750 customers around the world. And uh, I created a podcast called We the Human, which is a cybersecurity podcast that focuses on people and their part in cybersecurity. So yeah, a little bit about me. I've worked with banks, I've worked with telecom companies, I've worked with uh, our government, the education system, helping people be more secure, help them understand more about cybersecurity. And uh, hopefully I can help you guys understand a little bit more about it today. Okay, so here's what we're gonna talk about today. So what is cybersecurity? Like what does it actually mean? As Adam mentioned, no, it's kind of this big nebulous term. So I'm going to try and boil that down a little bit for you. We're going to talk about the relationship between cybersecurity and business or organizations, even some that you might be part of today. We're going to talk about the good guys and the bad guys. Who are these people that are out there performing these things? And what kinds of things are they actually doing? We're going to talk about the skills gap. So there is a huge, huge gap in the cyber market right now for talent. And I'm going to show you some of the numbers around that to kind of give you an idea of what the impact is uh, of some of those roles that are related. We're talking about paths to get into cybersecurity. We're going to talk about specific roles, incident response, uh, security awareness, application security, offensive security, all kinds of cool stuff like that. And we're going to talk about different kinds of jobs. So what it's like to be a consultant, what it's like to be a professional, what it's like to run a security program at an organization. I'll give you a few minutes for questions at the end as well. So if you have a question, hold on to it, and then uh, I'll give you a chance to ask, and we can have a little bit back and forth. Okay, so what is cybersecurity? This is probably one of the biggest things that kind of gets to me as a cybersecurity professional is it's kind of like this huge blanket term. A lot of people think of tech, and they think of information technology or IT, and they're like, yeah, cybersecurity kind of falls into that. But that's like saying construction is one thing. Right? How many people here can name, put your hand up, if you can name a job that falls within construction? 
Ooh, tough crowds. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Electricians, plumbers, HVAC technicians, roofers, drywallers, plaster, there's all kinds of different things that you can do in construction. And cybersecurity is very similar. That's like saying medicine. Put your hand up if you can name a job within medicine that's not necessarily being a doctor. Yeah, okay, a couple of hands, all right, people are waking up, good. So in medicine, you can be a doctor, you can be a lab technician, you can be all kinds of different roles available in that field. So cybersecurity is very similar in that way. We do all kinds of different things. And when I talk to friends and family in cybersecurity, they're just like, they have no idea. I'm, I'm in a closet somewhere in a hoodie with a laptop and the lights off, a bunch of keys on a keyboard, that's the way they look at it. So cybersecurity at its core is a state of being protected against the criminal or unauthorized use of electronic data or the measures taken to achieve this. So what we're trying to do is protect technology and protect data and information. How many people here have a laptop or a phone that they use to connect to the internet? Okay, everybody, almost, yeah, virtually everybody. And those of you who don't put your hand up, I'm sure you have one and you're just going with it. But we all use the internet for something and we all have data that means something to us. But it's like cat photos on Instagram or pictures of your food when you go to a nice restaurant or whatever that is. That's valuable to you and you're using technology in some way to share that with your followers, your friends, whoever that is that might be identified. This is a quote from Bruce Schneier. He's an author and a cybersecurity expert. He's been in the industry longer than I've been alive. And he said, amateur hack systems, professionals hack people. I wanted to share this with you because Cybersecurity goes way beyond just securing the technology and, and, and how we use that technology. It also involves people and processes and technology and the way that we use those things in a day to day in the context of a business or an organization. So when I say organization, I mean a school or a sports team or a coffee shop. It doesn't necessarily have to be a technology organization like Facebook or TikTok or Instagram, for example. In terms of the context of what it means to a business or an organization, um, our number one priority as an organization like a business is to serve our customers or our clients, be able to do that efficiently, use technology for convenience to be able to do that. So for example, how many people here have had a teacher use a projector in their classroom? Okay, yeah, so that improves the convenience. When I was in high school, it was those clear sl slide things that you slid on the so overhead projector. Now there's projectors like this one. But the idea is that that's being used right here in the school. So it doesn't necessarily have to be an organization that's out to make money that needs to be secured. If a, a system were to you know, crash or come down as a result of a cyber incident in the school, maybe we wouldn't be able to access our content. Maybe we wouldn't be able to connect to the internet to share that with our students. Maybe we wouldn't be able to access resources and information that are available to us. So just an example that it doesn't always necessarily pertain back to the business. Uh, Google hacker. Has <laughs> anybody heard the term hacker before? If you haven't heard the term hacker, yeah. Scammer, malicious actor, all kinds of different uh, stuff. This is what Google returns. So this is what my parents think that I do for a living. Uh, generating invisible digital numbers over a keyboard and a hoodie. Um, but yeah, this is sort of like what we typically see when we think of a hacker. Not if this is what you kind of think of when you think of a hacker. Maybe, yeah. Yeah, okay. TV shows, movies, things of that nature, news articles, they'll grab this picture off the internet. This is what we typically see, but what if I told you that this could be a hacker? Would you believe me? That'd be hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> it would be hilarious. Well, last year, a cardiologist in the U.S. was accused for creating ransomware in his downtime. It was actually that, um, it wasn't actually this person's individual, but the point I want to try and, and, and make here is that Cybersecurity criminals, malicious actors, they aren't necessarily a teenager in a hoodie in a closet in Russia. You pass them in the supermarket. They could be some of your classmates that have an aptitude for doing this kind of stuff. Uh, your doctor could be a ransomware developer. What's interesting about this story is this doctor actually had a really poor bedside manner, but had really great reviews on the black market for the ransomware industry. Fine enough. So just changing your perception a little bit about what cybersecurity is, who's actually involved in this kind of stuff, and what it takes to actually protect an organization. What kind of thing you want. So what it boils down to is organizations have crown jewels. They have assets. And those assets are under attack by malicious actors. 
Cybersecurity professionals are trying to create that shield, that secure perimeter to protect those ground rules and those assets and prevent those malicious actors from stealing. Whether it's somebody in Russia, whether it's somebody here, whether it's your doctor, whoever it is, we want to try and make sure that those people don't get access to those things. You could think, okay, does this actually happen? Well, actually, it does. So this is a chart from StatsCan, Statistics Canada, uh, where they surveyed uh, police departments and federal entities uh, in terms of reported cyber incidents between 2014 and 2021. So in 2014, we saw about 15,184 reported cyber incidents in Canada. In 2021, we saw 70,288. Those are the ones that were reported. I think it has more of an impact than you see on the graph. So in the last less than 10 years, last nine years, we've actually watched, well, sorry, it's between 2014 and 2021. So in less than 10 years, we saw the number of reported cyber incidents in Canada more, uh, nearly quintupled. So it's almost five times the number of cyber incidents that we've seen reported in 2014 and 2021. That's huge. That's a lot of cyber incidents. So stats only the sum of well. So 82% of cyber incidents actually involve people. How many people here, how many of you know what a phishing email is? You end up knowing a phishing email. Okay, a few. All right, cool. Not phishing with an F. I don't mean an email with fish pictures in that. I mean a phishing email with the H. So what we typically see, for example, is a malicious actor will create an email that looks legitimate, that actually links off something that's malicious. So whether it's a program that will install on your computer or a website that looks real, that's actually fake, harvest your information, they'll send that to you and they'll say, hey, um, your Netflix account has been locked. We need you to authenticate and you know, unlock your, your Netflix account. Or your TikTok account has been locked. Or your Instagram account has copyrighted content. These are the kinds of things that they'll send you. You get that in your email or you get it in a text message and you think, oh yeah, I have to deal with this right now. And you click on that and then they get access to your accounts. And you might think, Ian, what's the value of an Instagram account? What's the value of a TikTok account? What are they really gonna do with that kind of stuff? Well, imagine you have your device, your phone or your laptop. How many people have had their parents take their phone or their laptop? Their hand up. Okay, a little bit of shame there, all right, I get it. Okay, so imagine your parents wanted you to pay $10,000 to get your phone or your laptop back. That's essentially what these cyber criminals are doing. Your TikTok account might not have secrets to getting rich, but it's important to you, which means they'll use that to extort you and try and get information, or excuse me, try and get money from you or try and get you to do something for them, like carry an attack and follow some steps. 62% of that is from the supply chain. So what we typically see is these malicious actors will get into an organization, they'll compromise an account, and then they'll move laterally. So that means, They'll compromise Ms. Celia's account, and then they'll send an email from Ms. Celia's account to all of her colleagues to try and get them to fall victim. And then they'll email from those accounts to other schools, and then from those schools to other schools and to the district. And that's how they work. They move a lot. So when we talk about the business context, as a business and MMP, we buy um, Lenovo ThinkPad laptops, as an example. And we have cleaners that come into our building, and we have a property manager that owns the building that we rent. So these are all part of our supply chain. So what we'll typically see is a malicious actor will compromise one of their accounts and try and attack us or try and attack other supply chain. Um, the number one core behavior that, that, that we observe is password reuse. How many people here reuse the passwords? Be honest. Be honest. Okay. Like, Your hands come up. Okay. This is the number one uh, core behavior that we see in security building. So you go to a website, you buy Coachella tickets to go to Coachella, or you buy something, a swimsuit online, or you uh, book a plane ticket, you do something online, you use your credentials, that website gets compromised. Someone goes in and they steal all the accounts from that, and you've reused the password on that website that you use for Facebook, that you use for your bank account, you use for all these different things. And what they'll do is they'll take that password and they'll just try and log into everything that you own uh, until they get access Try and store you. How many people here use Instagram? Yeah. Okay. How many people use Facebook? But it's going. Okay. All right. Cool. Okay. So I saw a scam recently on Instagram where someone was commenting on really positive pictures, and they were saying, uh, "Did you know that Instagram will block out your password if you type in the comments?" 
What do you think people were doing? Typing their path. Typing in their path. <laughs> or they in the comments. So essentially what you would see is thousands of passwords and handles right in the comments. And what they'll do is they'll just sort of create a script that watches and harvests that. They'll grab your information and then they'll go off to Outlook or Hotmail, I'm going to date myself a little bit, or Gmail. And they'll try and access your email account using that password because a lot of people need it. $12.3 million in Canada was the impact of businesses uh, in the first part of 2022. That's from 11,395 incidents in, uh, in my second, the first quarter of 2022. So huge, huge money being exfiltrated from businesses here in Canada. And like I said, it's going to terrorist organizations. It's going to kids in hoodies and closets. Uh, it's going overseas to Russia and China. Uh, all different sorts of places. So, yeah, pretty huge impact. What could you do with $12 million? Awesome. This is a quote from a woman named Brittany Kennedy, formerly the director of information security at AMC Theaters. Uh, and now she is uh, the business information security officer at Carbon Health. So she runs security for a health authority in the US. And she said that cybersecurity leaders may have to create a message of influence because security is a culture and you need to visit the place and be part of that security culture. So the emphasis from this quote that I want you to take away is that it's not necessarily all about the technology. The way that we think about technology is also a really critical part of how secure it is. So you don't have to be a develop a software developer to help make things secure. If you're good at soft skills, like interacting with people, culture development. Human resources actually plays a really big part in that culture development. You can play a part in cybersecurity. It's a couple of examples of attacks. So uh, many of them are specific from 2022. So some anybody have parents here that travel or grandparents that travel, go down south in the summer, some of the or the winter, some of the yeah. So uh, filming in 2022, they had a huge outage. There was something like 6,500 people that were stuck in airports for like three days or something like that because the system went down. Funny enough, the CEO of Sunwing said, a system that never goes down went down as a result of cyber security incident. So, Empire Company, who here has been to a Sobeys before? People are still shy. Yeah, so Empire owns Sobeys. Uh, they own IGA. They own a whole bunch of different stuff. So they were hit with uh, a cyber incident and it's now being... Sur surfaced recently, last few days, that they compromised a ton of information. My wife worked at Sobeys when she was in high school, so like 10 years ago, or not, 12, 10, 12 years ago. And they sent her a letter saying, hey, uh, people lost your SIM number. <laughs> not good. Um, another single topic here, remember the first report to change the email password after the cyber attack in Canadian government. Anybody here, anybody here know what a number is? So that's somebody that exists locally that represents us in the federal government. So I wanted to put that up there to show you that even governments are subject to these things. Um, individuals can fall victim. I actually had an interview on my podcast with a guy from the UK who emailed the director of Homeland Security in the US and asked them out for coffee. And the guy sent him his personal email address, thinking that he was somebody else. <laughs> A couple other examples here. These ones specifically are related to fishing and social engineering. So, has anybody here heard the term social engineering before? Yeah, okay, a couple of hands. Okay, so social engineering would be engineering a social interaction. Sounds kind of, seems like a pretty straightforward answer, but the idea is that I could convince you that I'm somebody that I'm not to get you to give up information or money or something that effect. So, these examples Uber, who here has heard of Uber before? Yeah, we don't have it here, unfortunately, but. Uh, Uber, he got hit with a huge phishing attack. Somebody emailed in pretending to be someone from the supply chain and an employee at Uber clicked, and that gave access to the malicious actor who stole a whole bunch of records. There's others like Opta, which is a technology company in the US. Uh, you're calling them the hotel group. Has anybody here ever stayed at a hotel before? <laughs> okay, yeah. So IHT is like Holiday Inns, uh, and they have about 200,000 employees. They lost a ton of information as a result of somebody Clicking on an email uh, and then clicking on a link in email. So just a couple of examples. I just want to show you some of the headlines that are out there. Okay, so you guys use Facebook. Anybody here use Facebook Marketplace? Yeah. Anybody here in like your local, like your 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 neighborhood Facebook group? You guys know what I'm talking about? Usually a lot of moms on there that are talking about someone riding their bike in a way they didn't like. You know, you guys are probably the subject of a lot of that tension. So. <laughs> 
Uh, this is an example from one locally. So this is in uh, this is our post right now. This is from Salisbury, Brunswick. And uh, this guy has a catalytic converts of car. So essentially, it's a piece of an exhaust on the car. It's worth a lot of money. Since so probably people stealing them, they post this picture of this guy. It's soluble. Uh, yeah, you're only stealing catalytic converters. This one on the right hand side is actually the same post, but six hours later. So what they did was they posted the one on the left. It shows this guy in space. Gets a ton of shares. People are like, yeah, if I see this guy. He's in trouble. Like, we're going to share this guy's face. We're going to report him to the police. They get a ton of shares. People are seeing it on their news feed in Facebook. And then they change the content to say, in search of a family to rent on this beautiful property. I think this was done in like December. A little low on screen for us here, although it's been pretty mild. So yeah, kindly visit this link, uh, and I'll get back to you as soon as possible. So what they do is this share is out. Across that kind of all these individuals that share this post, it's in their newsfeed. All their friends see it. They share it. Their family members. Then they change the content. So now the reach of the number of people that can actually see this post is huge. And somebody knows somebody who's looking for a new place to rent or a house to buy or something that's not a thing. So the point I'm trying to make here is that this is where Facebook is being used to socially engineer people to clicking on something. How many people here know somebody who's been scammed on Facebook? Couple of hands, okay, yeah. So it's rampant, it's going crazy. There's a ton of this sort of stuff. So it's important that you look out for this stuff. If something seems like it's too good to be true, questions. Uh, another example here. So I want to share this one. Anybody hear about the Fredericton tours of Instagram that got compromised? Maybe, maybe not. I'm sure, it's not really on your. It's not on your Discover feed. The Fredericton <laughs> tours. Okay, so uh, I think it was in 2021. Uh, city of Fredericton, or actually it might have been in 22, the city of Fredericton, they were doing a big push on tourism because of that pandemic, trying to get people back out, doing things in Fredericton. And somebody actually compromised their account by convincing the person running the Instagram account that they had copyrighted photos on there, and they needed them to log in and verify that the images weren't copyrighted. They clicked on a link, put in their username and password, which the malicious actor harvested, and then they logged, the malicious actor logged into the Instagram account, changed the password, it started posting a ton of nasty stuff, a bunch of like really not appropriate stuff, threatening members of the staff, saying that they're going to kill their family, all this stuff. Right on this public Instagram feed, really, really not good. So the city of Fredericton builds a brand, right? They want people to come and spend time in Fredericton, want to try and attract people from externally. And now their Instagram is posting all this really nasty stuff, as you can imagine. So I'm friends with the CIO, his name's Adam Bell. And uh, did a really good job of delivering sort of like a summary of what was happening here. But actually, they compromised the account. They said, we want $2,500 to give you your account back. Uh, and then, you know, the city doesn't negotiate with the side of the criminal. So they said, no, we're not going to do that. And ultimately, they ended up having to find some back channels through Facebook to, and through Meta to get that, that access back. But the point I'm trying to make here is that although the Fairton Tourism Instagram probably doesn't seem like a really high priority crown jewel, not something like 911 systems or water system and that stuff. Uh, it can still be used to export that entity for money or information. Okay. So let's talk about skills gap. Should I do a quick time check here? Yeah. Okay. Let's talk about the skills gap. In 2021, there were 950,000 cybersecurity jobs in the US. 950,000, almost a million cybersecurity jobs. That's not to fill about 50 NFL football stadiums. Anybody here ever been to an NFL game? Okay, what about an NHL game? Yeah, okay. So you can fill about 50 of those stadiums or rings with the number of people that work in cybersecurity. By comparison, I hope this might be a relevant statistic. Everybody here has been to a convenience store at some point in their life, right? They're everywhere on every street corner. You can go to the store and get a snack. There's about 173,209 people that work in convenience stores in the US. So there's almost uh, there are five times the number of people working in cybersecurity than there are in convenience stores, and there's a lot of convenience stores. Of those 950,000 jobs in the U.S., 465,000 of them were not filled. Right, like more than half of them are not filled. So that was in 2021. Just to give you an idea. 
And then by 2025, Cybersecurity Ventures, which is a firm that invests in cybersecurity companies, estimates there will be about 3.5 million cybersecurity jobs available in uh, 2025 globally. Crazy. Cybersecurity jobs right now are becoming some of the best paid jobs as well out of post-secondary education and long-term. So not only is there demand for these roles, employers are coming to the table and saying, we want to pay for skills because we need cybersecurity assets. This is a great, if you're thinking about it, if you're like cybersecurity is something that appeals to me, it's a great time for you to think about being in the cybersecurity business. Okay, let's talk about the pathways again. I've talked about cybersecurity, I've talked about Instagram and cutting, cutting catalytic converters, and I've talked about your passwords. So let's talk about what you have to do to actually get in and do one of those jobs. How do I get there? Of course, you can do computer science or IT based post secondary education. So you can go do computer science at university. Uh, NBCC has great programs. So do some of the private colleges. You can do system administration, where you work on servers and infrastructure. You can do network infrastructure, all kinds of things. That will give you a really good foundation of understanding how the system works. And then once you understand how the system works, you can start to make changes and tweaks to it and, and learn more about the security. Credential programs. So I'm going to talk a little bit about my experience here in a second and show you how credentialing goes in. So maybe you go to school and you're like, hey, you know what? I don't really know what I want to do yet, or um, you know, liberal arts is something that appeals to me, or I think I want to go and take business. And then you get into that field and you're like, man, this is not what I expected. You can take a credential and you can transition over into cybersecurity using your transferable skills. So for example, in my case, I talked about how I started as a graphic designer. How does a graphic designer become a cybersecurity professional? You talk about that in a minute. Thirdly is transferable skills like arts, communications, things of that nature. So in cybersecurity awareness, which is something I'm going to talk about, which is training and skills and teaching people how not to fall victim to cybersecurity attacks. I'd say 90% of the people that I've worked with related to security awareness have non-technical backgrounds. They worked in marketing, they worked in HR, they did something along those lines. It gives them the soft skills to interact with folks and helps them be a better security professional. So like I said, computer IT-based education, credential programs, and then transferable skills. Don't feel like you have to go learn how to write code to be a security professional. It's not the case. Okay, so here's a little bit about my journey. Oh my goodness, my animations are all messed up. Okay. I'll just bring all these in. They're going to be able to follow their nice. Um, yeah, I started to a really nice emoji there. Me sweating because I didn't know what I wanted to do. Okay. Okay. So I started graphic design. Um, I was fully bought in. Beanie, thick rim glasses, MacBook, $9 coffee. I sold. That's what I wanted to do for a living. And I did that in school. I took software development and graphic design. When I finished that, I actually worked in that. So I was a graphic designer for a chemical company in Fredericton for a while, and it was fun, but it wasn't what I was expecting. So then I pursued that software development piece. I thought that maybe it might be more appealing to me. And I have an actual aptitude for it, and I actually liked it a lot. As a software developer, I worked at the University of New Brunswick in IT services, so in higher ed. I worked at a couple of startup companies, and uh, my first dip of the toe in security was actually at IBM, where I worked on one of their security tools. So I get to work as a developer, and I was like, man, this cybersecurity stuff is really cool. It was something that I got to try out and it really appealed to me. And I'm actually happy that you have the Cybersecurity 12.0 course now because I had no idea that cybersecurity existed when I was in high school. When I was at IBM, um, we co-founded my tech company that I told you about, Postal Security, which builds a tool that helps cybersecurity professionals deliver cybersecurity resources. So a few friends and I got together and we were like, hey, let's start this company, be entrepreneurs, quit our full-time jobs, we'll sell our furniture, and we'll move into a you know, one-bedroom apartment. Just kidding, we didn't do that. But sort of that Silicon Valley kind of experience. Has anybody seen the show Silicon Valley? Yeah, no? Yeah. All right, Adam, okay. But yeah, that, that idea of starting a tech company, quitting my full-time job, and diving in head first, hoping for the best. And through that experience, I got to learn about securing a small organization, what it takes to do that. Because cybersecurity resources are expensive. And working with banks and telecom companies and schools and governments and cities, helping them make their organization 
more secure as well. And as part of that, I get some really great experience. I got to work as a security professional under uh, a friend and mentor of mine, a CEO at the time, and really got to learn a lot about making the organization more secure. And then subsequently started to take over the security for the company that we had built when we hit 65 employees, servicing customers all over the world. So after about five years of that, six years of that, I decided, okay, I need to make this official. And I pursue the, the Certified Information Security Manager designation. It's so one of the toughest ones. There's two that kind of tie CISSP and CISM pretty close, but it's pretty tough. So it's program management. It's everything related to the cybersecurity program in the organization. And I did that, passed the exam. It's like a four-hour exam. Uh, I had to have five years of experience, which I had. And somebody else sign off for me, and then I get to join the club and be a CISM, have those letters out. Me. So now I'm a bona fide cybersecurity professional. My company was doing well, and we had stood up to a point where it's essentially running itself. So I wanted to get more hands-on back to helping organizations be secure, and I joined the team here at MNP as a consultant. So now uh, I'm what you call a senior manager in cyber risk management, and I work with organizations to implement security. So I help them make to their security program uh, better. So help them identify gaps where the program's falling down. Maybe they could do better with a firewall. Maybe they've got their you know, people taking their laptops home, giving them to their kids to browse stuff that they shouldn't. Uh, maybe they let people walk in the front door with signing in, all these sorts of things that uh, help make the organization more secure. I get to do that. I'm going to talk a little bit about that now. So let's talk about roles in cybersecurity. Um, we're getting close on time, so I might pick up the pace a little bit just to give you a little bit more time. So the security operations center, in there you get to detect threats, you get to investigate alerts, you get to sound the alarm. Um, this is all in case one looks like. Monitors on the wall, so uh, I've been in a couple places where um, there's a security operations center that actually monitors for cyber threats in nuclear power plants. It's pretty cool stuff. They want you to like take, give your fingerprint, have a pet badge on, and that be escorted at all times. They've got monitors all over the wall, and they can see everything that's going on in the organization at all times on those monitors. And they look for threats. They look for anomalies. When systems indicate to them that something's not right, they investigate, uh, and they get to sound the alarm. They get to raise the flag and say, if you think there's an incident, we need to respond to this. Offensive security. Or offset. We love acronyms in cybersecurity, by the way. Offset. So pen friction test. Web team. The bug bounties. So pen test essentially is where somebody goes into an application or a system. Hey, yeah, the Facebook app, we want to make sure that somebody can't break in and steal information. So as a pen tester, I go and try and break into that app and then I report on my findings. Yeah, I was able to copy and paste this into here, and that gave me access to this system. And then I got that user's password by deleting this. So we can do that with apps, we can do that with servers, we can do that with computers, we can penetration test those systems to find uh, holes. Red teaming is doing that constantly for an organization. So I could come and work for the government, and I would essentially do that for systems and government all the time. Bug bounties, bug bounties are super cool. A lot of the uh, pen testers, the, the offset people that I know, they pursue bug bounties in their spare time. They'll go and test websites and apps for fun, then they'll submit that to the company and say, you have 90 days to fix this or I'm going to make it public. And they'll typically pay that person for identifying that bug. A friend of mine not long ago did it on the RBC Bank website. I should do yeah. that. In Moncton. He lives in Moncton. He did that on the RBC Bank website. Uh, yeah, so we'll stop there. Okay, app set or applications. Totally, we love our app apps. Security testing, code review, and vulnerability management. Maybe coding is for you. Maybe software development, computer science is what you're into. Getting to be on the team, getting to be the person that says yes or no, this is secure or not secure, is a really cool part of the flow. I got to do that for a while when I was at Boston on Security. So we're looking to see, did somebody put in a username and password and forget to take it out? Or is there some indication of the system that we're building here that would give somebody access from the exit? Vulnerability management means that we're using different libraries and components in our app and then as those get updated, we want to make sure that they're not compromising the security of our application. So it's constantly having a look at this application, this system, making sure that there's not vulnerabilities that need to be This is a cool one, incident response. Responding to incidents. Uh, uh, so I am 
So network isolation. So when someone in the SOC says, hey guys, uh, there's something going on here and I think that there's an incident happening, we get to spring into action as incident response professionals. We get to segregate the network off and make sure that that, that malicious actor can't get out of that portion of the network with all the access. We get to threat hunt, which means we get to crawl through the systems of the organization, find the bad guys, and potentially counterattack them, depending on the type of incident. And we also get to do ransom negotiation. I know a guy that literally does that for an insurance company for a living. He talks to malicious actors and negotiates the ransom that they're asking when they steal assets and wanted for the negotiation. It's literally like the things you see in the movies where they're on the phone, you know, somebody holds up a bank, they throw a phone in and they talk. You got to get it a lot, man. Like that's kind of the same sort of thing. Governance, risk, and compliance. That's what I do, GRC. I work in GRC with uh, MNB. So control review, threat risk assessments, and compliance certification. So control review is literally looking at all of the different things we do. Do you have a firewall? Do you have antibodies? Do you have multi-factor authentication? Do you have email filter? Um, threat risk assessments is looking at what the organization does, what are some of the risks related to the data they might be handling, what are some of the things that they need to put in place to protect against that, and then compliance certification is uh, essentially taking those governing bodies that sort of put those things in place and making sure that the organizations are compliant. So how many people have Devacare? Yeah? Okay. You ever think that maybe when you're putting that into a machine, into a random store, that somebody could maybe get access to your information and you do that. It's called PCI certification, and we actually go in and make sure that that organization is allowed to have a debit machine. Uh, and if they aren't compliant, they get that taken away. Okay, uh, security awareness and training. This one is my favorite out of all of them. So simulating attacks in organizations. I know people that actually break into a business. Put on a hard hat, carry a ladder. Do you know that if you carry a ladder and a clipboard, you can get in anywhere? <laughs> I mean, anywhere. It's a really great video of guys that I go to the movie theater carrying a ladder at the hall, and they literally do it like nine times in a row um, without getting caught. I was simulated attacks, so simulated email attacks, simulated social engineering attacks, training, gamification, engagement, culture. If working with people is something you like, there's a place for you in cybersecurity and security awareness. Social engineering, as I mentioned before, so doing those attacks, pretending to be somebody you're not, it's super fun to call somebody on the phone. Um, I actually had a friend that had to do it the other day, and he was pretending to be a employee at the business. And we said, yeah, it's Kevin calling. We need access to that thing. He, everybody was hanging up. They had a phenomenal uh, uh, rate of not being compromised. Kevin had been fired like the week before. So when he was calling saying, hey, it's Kevin, they were like, no, I'm not giving you access. Okay, job okay, so what kind of actual jobs can you do? I only got three here. These sort of like level-based roles. So an analyst or a professional. A lot of organizations will have an internal security team. So you get to work as a security professional or a security analyst within that organization helping protect that organization. Think of it as like the castle and moat. You're there to help fortify, protect. You can get any one of the jobs just talked about, incident response, application security, offensive security, any of that stuff for your organization. Typically work on a team, depending on the size of the organization, the team will change. And it's an on-the-ground security work. So it's literally digging into the controls, looking at uh, the, the information to see if someone might be compromising the organization and responding and doing things to that time. Second is consultants, sort of like the gun for hire. Uh, I get to work with all kinds of different organizations from 10 to 110,000 employees in banking, in power, government, and municipality. I think I've said this like four times already in this presentation. But you get tons of experience in a short amount of time. I just did a threat risk assessment for credit union that has 150 people. I did one for an oil company that has 75 people. I'm doing one for a federal uh, federal government organization right now that has 30 people. And they're all different. They all have their own unique sets of challenges. They all carry different types of information. And I get to be the guy that goes in there, uses it with my phone, and tell them, hey, here's how you need to make your organization more secure. It's an awesome thing. And finally, this one is kind of like a really high level one. So this is the Chief Intelligence and Security Office. This leads the cybersecurity strategy. Like I said, we like our acronyms, CISO. They work with business leaders. So they aren't really working with technology and helping to secure the organization in the context of zeros and ones, all that all. And they work in cyber information and physical security. 
gone friends with the CISO at ND Power, for example, and he's responsible for making sure that the guards are always at the door and that the swipe cards work to get in. And he doesn't do that himself. He has teams of people that do that. And he relates the risks of those things to business leaders like the CEO, like the COO, like the board, the people that oversee the organization. Okay, so we're pretty tight on time. We have about nine minutes left. I can go a couple minutes after if need be. Um, any questions? Oh, yeah. Okay. Let's start over here. Go ahead. Do you think of uh, Twitter locking two-factor authentication? Yes, great. That's an awesome question. Yeah, so the question was, what, what do I think about Twitter locking two-factor authentication to paid accounts? Yeah. The little clarification point, uh, it's actually only text-based multi-factor. They'll let you do multi-factor authentication on your account. They're only letting people that pay do it with a text-based code. I think it's not a great way to do it. Who here, does anybody here not know what multi-factor authentication is? Don't be shy. It's okay. Okay. All right. I'll explain. So you log into your account. It sends you a code on your phone, and then you punch in the code in order to get access. And it just means that if somebody gets your password, they won't be able to get in unless they have the code. So, okay. So Twitter recently announced that in order to have that, you have to, with, with uh, sort of text based codes, you have to have Twitter Premium or Twitter Blue, whatever they call it these days. Um, and essentially, I think the rule of thumb is, it costs money to send text messages so they only want to let the people that pay send text messages to themselves. You can do it other ways. They can email you a code. Uh, there's an app called the Authenticator app that you can use to multi-factor authenticate. All kinds of different things you can do, but they're, they're letting uh, only letting Twitter Blue subscribers do it with text. I think it's a really bad move, and I'll tell you why. The number of people that will stop using multi-factor authentication because they can't do it with text anymore is, is going to be huge. A lot of people are just going to take away multi-factor because they don't want to set up an authenticator app, or another way of multi factor authenticating. Um, and that's a really great example. There are skills lacking in cybersecurity right now that think about end users and how it's going to impact them. And we really need people with soft skills, you know, not necessarily programmers, developers, uh, but people that actually know how people work uh, to help make our cybersecurity system strong. That's a great question. Yeah, does that answer? That's kind of long. So, okay. Yeah, go ahead. That situation you described where like, um, so when you get your information, like hold it for ransom. Is that an example? Is that an example of ransomware? Yeah, great question. So the question was, is the example of someone stealing your information and extorting you, uh, is that an example of ransomware? It is. Ransomware is a little bit more technical. So ransomware stands for ransom software. What they'll do is they'll come into your organization, they'll wrap a big chain and lock or all of your stuff. And they'll say, if you want it back, you got to pay us 10,000 Bitcoin. And, uh, and then it will give you a, a decryptor key, like a code that you punch into the software and it will give your information. So yes, it's similar to that. The ransomware is more technical in terms of actually locking your information up. And extortion, you just go to the national extortion. Hey, I got pictures of you doing something you shouldn't have been. I was watching you in your webcam. Hey, I stole your Instagram account if you want it back. Or hey, I have all your text messages where you're texting your best friend's boyfriend. You know, I'm going to give them to them if you don't give me this money. That's that's more an example of extortion, extortion in France. Does that answer your question? Great. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah. Sorry, a little louder. Uh, so, yeah. yeah, so that's a good question. A CISO is top dog. They are typically the leader of security in the organization. Um, the question, do they get paid the most? That depends on the context. As a consultant, if you're a cybersecurity expert and you're working with a lot of organizations, you can make more money as a consultant if you, if you have expertise. Um, think of it as, you know, like your principal, this might be a bad example. Your principal here is your principal at school. That'd be kind of like the CISO in the security world. So you have a bunch of people that report into that individual and they work for that individual. The CISO runs the teams that helps keep the organization secure. Okay, any other questions? Um, red. Yes. Um, why do you have to go through all the trouble of going through so many advanced steps when we're replacing the transport attack? You can probably easily just go into your system files and edit the source code of set transport attack so you don't have to, like, you know, to pay 10,000 to Bitcoin just to get your files back. Yeah, great question. Um, it's a little bit more complicated than us. The question was why not just edit your system files to prevent ransomware attacks? Great question. Essentially, the way you look at it is risk and mitigation. 
So you have risks on a, on your technology based on what you're using. So I have all my banking information on my laptop as an example. That's that information is inherently risky to have because it's valuable. So what we look at in terms of uh, risk based approaches, what things have we done to try and prevent somebody from getting access to that? So in your example, if I wanted to prevent my, somebody from getting by giving me ransomware, I would have uh, an endpoint detection and response, or like an antivirus, out of a firewall that prevents known malicious IPs from accessing my network. And I would encrypt my hard drive so that if someone did get access to their hard disk, they wouldn't be able to decrypt the files without some kind of quantum Does that make sense? So it's like three things I would do to prevent that. You're on the right track, though. Things things you have to do to prevent somebody from being Great question. Yeah, you had a question. Yeah, go ahead. Um. So do when businesses need uh, cybersecurity professionals, do they always have to go through like a company who hires them or do they hire their own? Great question. Yeah, great question. The question was, if someone needs a cybersecurity professional, do they hire them themselves or do they hire a company that doesn't? Yeah, great question. It depends on the organization. So let's say, for example, I'm a coffee shop and we have like eight employees. Uh, I'm not, I might not hire a cybersecurity professional because maybe I can't afford it. Uh, maybe I can't find, you know, you saw all the different things you could do. Maybe I can't find somebody that does all those things. So I would go to a company like MNP Digital and say, you know, I really need cybersecurity resources. Uh, what can you do for me? And they might pay the same amount as having one individual, except we'll have 20% of their time will be incident response. The 20% of their time will be security awareness. The 20% of the time will be Offensive security. So sort of doing all of those things. So the short answer to that, I'm a little bit long winded today. So the short answer to that would be it really depends on what the needs of the organization are. Larger organizations have internal security teams. You know, Bell, Rogers, Telus, RBC, Scotiabank. Small organizations will usually get a consultant to come in and help them with that stuff, sort of on an hour by hour basis. Does that make sense? So is somebody going looking to get into the field? Personally, I like the variety of consulting. I get to work with tons of different organizations in all different kinds of sectors, learn about their problems, learn how they operate, learn new things. That's what I like. But maybe you just want to be a part of the team that secures just one organization. That's okay too. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, the uh, lab that's getting leaked to the file. What about it? Uh, any comments on yeah, so commenting on the no fly list getting leaked. Um, not really. I think what we've seen is in general in cybersecurity, because of the lack, because of the skills gap, because of the lack of resources, everybody's doing everything they can to try and just to stop the building from burning down. Like we know things are on fire. Uh, we're just doing our best to try and keep the fire contained, if that makes sense. So, you know, I hear. IHG is a great example, uh, Holiday, Holiday Intels, right? And um, malicious actor sent a phishing email, someone clicked on a link and gave access to that malicious actor. IHG uses a password vault, so all of their organizational passwords are stored in a password vault. And the password to access the password vault was QWERTY1234. <laughs> the QWERT one, two, three, four, right? So super easy. So just that a little bit of maturity in that area could be really great. Okay, we're out of time. I think I'm getting to my I, Yeah, I think we're going to have to cut on. Unfortunately, we're out of time. Sure. I would just like to thank you so much for coming to speak to us today. So I have a little carpet. Thank you very much. Thanks.